Okay, this is the third uh, unit of Medicine Through Time Paper 1, and what this video is going to cover is everything to do with industrial medicine, 1700 to 1900. So what I'm aiming to do in this video is to focus on the three strands of the exam, what were the cause of disease and who improved it, treatment and surgery, and then prevention of illness. So what we need to understand first is the cause of illness. Now, an overview at the start of this unit. Remember, the years 1700 to 1900 were all about the Industrial Revolution. So Britain were significantly ahead of the majority of countries at this time. But in medical terms, the four humours was no longer widely believed. We talked about that at the back end of the Renaissance, about how that was being questioned. Bleeding and purging were common treatments at times, and it was still being used. Apothecaries did still sell herbal remedies. Things like the plague did disappear, but it was replaced with new illnesses that became very common with epidemics, such as smallpox. Not by 1900, germs were discovered, which we're going to talk about in a bit. Jenner discovered the first vaccine for smallpox. Surgery improved significantly. There was a scientific revolution. Society was changing Cities began to grow, government started to get involved, medicine changed significantly. And people still believed in miasma, as you'll learn about when we look at Jon Snow, but it was becoming less popular. So I'm going to go through a range of different people, their ideas, the positives and the negatives, just in case you got a 16 marker on these key people. So first, Louis Pasteur. Remember, the key things are you need to know what they did, the impact, both positive and negative. So in 1861, Louis Pasteur published his germ theory. Now, this was to disprove an old idea called spontaneous generation. Spontaneous generation meant that basically germs appeared from nothing. They basically appeared from rotting. That's what a lot of people believe, but rotting caused germs. So ultimately, what we need to understand here is that Louis Pasteur published his idea. He proved that germs were causing liquids to decay, disproving spontaneous generation. So ultimately, it led him to the theory that germs might be causing disease in the human body. He didn't prove that until 1878. Microscopes had improved. So Louis Pasteur was able to magnify to a higher level so that images were clearer to see. Louis Pasteur looked at microbes in wine, vinegar, beer, etc. And he came to the these four conclusions. Air contains living microorganisms. So we have these microorganisms in the air. Germs can be killed by heating them. And this is why they started to pump heat into surgical theatres. Microbes in the air cause decay and they're not evenly, not evenly distributed. That basically means... Germs could be anywhere. So Pasteur proved spontaneous generation was wrong. He got the ball rolling in regards to germs. He said that germs were causing decay. They may also cause disease, which led to 1878, his germ theory of infection. So ultimately, this gave his idea more credibility and ended up proving his theories. So the positives and the negatives are just on the other side of this slide. Positive. People like Joseph Lister read Pasteur's work and linked it to infection problems in surgeries. Then you had an individual called John Tyndall who said that small particles in the air started talking about it. So he took on Pasteur's work further, which gave it more credibility. And I think another key thing you need to have in the positive impact was without this work, it wouldn't have developed the work of Robert Koch. The limited impact here, Pasteur wasn't a doctor. His work was on decay and food and not illness. Spontaneous generation, a lot of people still listen to because other doctors said it was more important, such as Dr. Bastian. And really, doctors didn't really give any credibility to Pasteur's ideas. However, without Louis Pasteur, we would not have had the next individual. Robert Koch. Now, Robert Koch took on, took on the work of Louis Pasteur 
by identifying the different microbes that caused individual diseases. So he found the bacteria for anthrax, tuberculosis and typhoid, and also discovered the bacteria for cholera. This was a massive step forward because it was easy now to identify what caused which illness, which therefore allowed it allowed treatment and prevention to become more impactful. Now, Robert Koch made it easier for other scientists to grow bacteria by developing a method. So he used agar jelly in a Petri dish, making it easier to study germs under a microscope. He also used industrial dye, which we still use today, to see certain cancerous tumours. The key thing is he inspired a generation of other people, which led to other individuals finding the germs for diphtheria, pneumonia, meningitis and tetanus. So Robert Koch ultimately was a key individual. He received the Medical Nobel Prize for his work with bacteria. So positives, it was a significant breakthrough because the disease was studied rather than the symptoms. He made it easier to see microbes by developing a dye that would stain them. He inspires other scientists. He wins a Nobel Prize for his contributions to bacteriology. However, we need to understand that the limited impact is, is just by discovering the germs that cause an illness doesn't directly help with medical treatment. It does take time for cures and vaccines to be developed. And Originally, the British government rejected the idea of germ theory. So his work, although it was more scientifically proven, took a little bit longer to gain popularity. The British government obviously had a lot of um, here's well, a lot of impact in making in changing people's attitudes, as at this time, the government was a lot more important than the church, as we discussed in that first slide. So cause of illness is near enough covered there. Now, in terms of uh, hospitals, again, giving you an overview of hospitals before we start looking at how they changed. Most of the hospitals were closed down in the Renaissance period. So by 1700, there were only five hospitals in London. But from the 18th century, wealthy people began to donate money towards hospitals. So more of them were open. Hospitals were now a place where sick people were treated as opposed to places they could rest. Now, what we need to understand here is that although hospitals were being used more for people who were like the deserving poor, they were still really poor at the start in regards to surgery. Now, the three key individuals that we're going to look at who had an impact in treatment all changed it in some sense of in some sense or another. So the first person, Florence Nightingale. So Florence Nightingale has two aspects to her. Firstly, the way in which she developed her reputation was that she went to the Crimean War. She read news reports said that hospitals were not fit for purpose. So she took 300 nurses to the Crimean War to try and change this. She changed the care of wounded soldiers. So she cleaned up the hospitals, 300 scrubbing brushes to get rid of the dirt organized to treat nearly 2,000 wounded soldiers. So she triaged the nurses to make sure they were separated to treat the patients. Clean bedding, good meals, and the mortality rate, the death rate in the Crimean War dropped from about 40% to 2%. So because she had mass a massive impact in the Crimean War, she then brought her expertise back to Britain. So what did she do? She created different wards separating patients and infectious patients. So those who were having surgery was on one ward, infectious patients on another. People were not being mixed at the risk of cross-infection. Cleanliness was vitally important. Tiles on hospital floors and painted walls and ceilings so surfaces could be easily cleaned. The focus on cleanliness was very important moving forward. Training for nurses. Nurses went from being sort of drunk, flirtatious, working class women to middle class professional women. And a way in which this was developed was through the setting up of the St. Thomas School for Nursing, in which Florence Nightingale raised 44,000 of her own money to do this. 
He wrote notes on nursing, which set out the key role of nurses and the expectations, which again developed the professionalism of this job. Surgery was another big issue. So as we mentioned before, in the 18th century, surgery was dangerous. The three big problems, bleeding, infection and pain. So we need to focus on the two big developments based on anaesthetics, which put patients to sleep, and antiseptics, which overall prevent, uh, prevent infection. So the development of anaesthetics. Remember, you don't need all of this. You just need to know what he did and the positives and the negatives. So what we need to understand is that the development of anaesthetics, it was happening before Simpson, but Simpson's develop of, development of chloroform had a significant impact in dealing with pain. So there was early experimentation with laughing gas. and The chemical ether had been used, but the patients vomited and the gas irritated the lungs and it was very flammable. So enter James Simpson. What does he do? So he discovered the benefits of chloroform. He gathered a group of friends together, inhaled the vapors, they sniffed chloroform and passed out. They came to the conclusion it would make an excellent anesthetic as they were asleep for the whole night. Queen Victoria used it during the birth of her son in 1853. She described the process as very soothing, so Queen Victoria using it gave it more respect and credibility. Simpson was knighted for his services to medicine. Surgeries became longer, more complicated, more complex because patients were asleep for longer. They no longer had to do just an amputation. But the dose had to be carefully controlled because it was easy to kill a patient based on an overdose. Now, the concept of chloroform also allowed for future development. So cocaine, for example, was used as the first local anaesthetic and a less addictive version of Novocaine was used in 1905. So chloroform laid the pathway for future anaesthetic developments. The positives and the negatives are down the side there. Um, longer surgeries, less patients died of shock. Queen Victoria used it and future discoveries such as Novocaine. Negatives, pain was dealt with but not infection. The possibility of an overdose if it wasn't dealt with, for example, Hannah Greener. The church disagreed with using chloroform in pregnancy due to being against God's will. Now, the next bit, the development of antiseptics. So this deals with infection. So historically, because of the lack of understanding about germs, surgeons actually didn't keep areas clean. The dirtier you were, the more experienced you were, which as a result led to more people dying of infection. Instruments were not washed and kept sanitary. It was common to survive surgery, but actually die of the infection, sepsis after the um, illness or the surgery, sorry. Now, what Lister did was he studied infected wounds and said that the flesh rotted. He compared results with Pasteur and he said maybe actually that's germs that are causing the flesh to rot. He operated in 1865 with a, well, a lad with a broken leg, added a bandage with lots of carbolic acid on and the wound healed nicely. He's published a lot of steps to ensure that wounds did not become infected. He sprayed carbolic acid in the air. But his ideas did not catch on quickly. Number one, because he couldn't explain it. Number two, because it dried out the patient's hands and they were worried what, uh, sorry, the surgeon's hands. So they were worried what it would do to the patient. The key thing is Lister changed attitudes because it led to the concept of aseptic surgery. So more, more surgeons focused on cleanliness, cleaning equipment, clean gowns, wearing masks, and making sure germs don't get in to the operating theatre. So consider the changes he made that were significantly impactful in developing a lesser rate of infection. Right, the next thing we're going to talk about is prevention of illness. Now, remember the last two things, last three things I spoke about 
rule to do with treatment. What we're going to talk about here is how illness was prevented. So the first thing we need to talk about is the smallpox vaccine and the role of Edward Jenner. Now, smallpox was a terrible illness. So what we need to understand, similar to the plague, there had been numerous outbreaks, 1722, 23, 40, 1796. But what was noted, especially by Jenner, is that if you caught a mild form of smallpox and then recovered, you didn't catch it again. Now, ultimately, this was called inoculation, and it was very, very dangerous. Some people decided to inoculate themselves by getting a mild dose of smallpox. So they would get pus from a smallpox scab, rub it into a cup, and basically give themselves a mild form of smallpox. This was very dangerous. People would die, people would spread it, and it cost a lot of money to quarantine these people. But inoculation was seen as the best chance of survival. Only the rich could really afford it. This is where Edward Jenner comes in. He provides not two things. Proof that inoculation is dangerous and the first ever vaccine. So Jenner took an interest in inoculations. He found evidence of thousands of cases where inoculation had failed. And he made an observation. Anyone who worked as a dairy maid, a milkmaid, would catch cowpox. Now, cowpox would be red blisters on the skin transmitted from cows to humans. Those who got cowpox did not get smallpox. Jenna made a connection. So what he did, he treated a local boy, James Phipps, in 1796 with cowpox. Six weeks later, he tried to infect him with smallpox, but he did not catch it. Now, this was one of a few attempts that Jenna had made to prove that this cowpox smallpox correlation worked. And by 1798, he wrote up his findings called the Inquiry into the Variola Vacciniae. He made sure the details were very, very clear and concise. And he wanted other people to use the vaccine to prevent smallpox from spreading. A massive step forward. But what was the impact? This is a really important part of this course because the major breakthrough versus not, there's a lot of argument here. So lots of people struggled to accept this. He didn't explain how it works or why it works. Inoculators were incredibly angry at losing their jobs. The government says here it started to favour the new method of vaccine from the first half of the 19th century. But let's look at this table here to look at the key breakdown of information. So it was a breakthrough. It was the first vaccination to deal with a specific disease. It was the only development in the prevention of disease before Jenner's was, sorry, it says that the only development in the prevention of disease before the vaccination was when inoculation was used. So really, Jenner's vaccination dealt with a lot of the problems that inoculation dealt with. Jenner's vaccine succeeded in preventing one of the major killer diseases. By 1900, it was nowhere near as much of a threat than it was in 1700. Free vaccinations were offered so that people in society could get um, protection from smallpox. By 1800, 100,000 people in the world had been vaccinated. Napoleon had his entire French army vaccinated. And by 1872, it was a compulsory vaccine. So thousands and thousands and thousands of people's lives were saved due to the smallpox vaccination. Now, there's a lot of argument against it being a major breakthrough, mainly because, one, many people resisted the vaccination because they didn't like using something that was linked to animals. A lot of the rich mainly believed that they would turn into a cow. Now, it had a limited impact until it was made compulsory in the years mentioned, 1853 and 1871. Preventative measures didn't change. Like, for example, during the cholera epidemic of the 19th century, they went back to old ideas like ordering barrels of tar to be burned based on the idea of miasma. So going round and removing the old ideas was actually more challenging at points. Jenner couldn't understand, or sorry, couldn't explain how the vaccine worked. 
so it couldn't be applied to other killer diseases. It was a one-off discovery for one illness. It didn't lead to other major breakthroughs. It just led to the development of, that, of the smallpox vaccine, and that's all it did. You could argue that actually it was really hard to copy this work or replicate it until we got Pasteur and Koch. Remember, Jenner was before Pasteur and Koch, so ultimately that caused problems in scientific understanding. And the third from the bottom there, some doctors mixed up smallpox and cowpox samples or reused needles. So that was a problem because some people were given full doses of smallpox before they had the cowpox. So there's lots of argument there with Edward Jenner. Now, the government. The government are really important in, in regards to this because ultimately the government began to get involved more because they had they decided to lose their laissez-faire attitude. So what we need to understand here, the government began to lose it. And we'll look at this bit here, the first public health act. So there was two public health acts, one in 1848 and one in 1875. In 1848, the government began to move away from their laissez-faire attitude. More men had the right to vote. And the government realised that a healthier population might allow them to get more votes. So when cholera arrived, the belief that it was spreading dirty water was backed up by Pasteur's findings. But the first public health act was not compulsory. So what we need to understand is that it did cost a lot of money to be able to add public health. The government did attempt to do some things in bigger cities. So in 1865, 1,300 miles of sewers built in London. Birmingham's were um, In Birmingham, slums were abolished and more people began to recognise it. it was everyone's responsibility to stay clean. The problem with the first Public Health Act is that actually that it was an encouragement to set up boards of health, get clean water, but it was too expensive and not compulsory. Which leads to the second Public Health Act. Everyone had to do it. They had to provide clean water, health officers, get rid of sewage properly, have public toilets, better quality housing and public parks. The second Public Health Act was another step to the government getting involved and being successful, which as a result leads to prevention of illness. The last one to consider for this video is John Snow and cholera. Now, this is a case study, so it's likely to come up as a bullet point in your GCSE. The focus of John Snow and cholera is that cholera was a terrible disease. If you caught cholera, you die two to six days later. It's very, very unpleasant. As you become dehydrated, the blood becomes thicker, ruptures blood vessels, turns them blue. So actually, cholera was nicknamed the Blue Death. Now, what we need to understand is that it arrived in Britain in 1831, London in February 1832, and there were rain, a range of epidemics. If you have a look there at the statistics, the number of people dying during cholera epidemics were quite significant. And this is what we need to understand moving forward. And the one which Jon Snow developed was the one that says 1853 to 54. So Snow was a surgeon who moved to Soho, London, and he observed the cholera uh, epidemic of 1848. And he came to a conclusion that cholera couldn't be uh, transmitted by miasma as it affected the stomach, not the lungs, because of the diarrhoea. He also concluded that drinking water was being contaminated by the cholera-ridden feces being disposed of in the drains. So he came up with this theory, but he had to prove it. So what he did in August 1854 was he created a spot map during the epidemic in Soho where the deaths occurred. And he identified that the majority of the people dying were all getting their water from the pump on Broad Street. He got rid of the handle and what happened? The cholera outbreak disappeared. And it was later found that the pump was one metre away from a cesspit. Cesspits where everyone put their waste. And ultimately, he made that conclusion that the contaminated drinking water was causing cholera. Happy days, there's proof. Remember, though, we don't know about germs yet. So what's the positives and negatives?
positive. In the short term, lots of people in Soho were saved. In the longer term, Snow's work made the link between dirty water and disease, which led to the Public Health Act of 1875. Lots of negatives, though. In 1855, John Snow presented his finding to the government. It was recommended the government make massive improvements to the sewer system. system. Now, ultimately, the government did this, but they weren't completed until 1875. So how serious did the government take John Snow? Lots of people rejected the work as it's as they basically said other people got cholera who lived away from the pump. Now, yes, some people did. Uh, for example, a woman that lived a few miles away from Broad Street, she had her water delivered to her from the Broad Street pump. She liked the taste. Some people didn't get cholera, like the workers at the local beer factory. Another reason why it was negative was because we didn't know about germs yet. So really hard to st put scientific analysis behind it. A lot of people clung to the idea of miasma. Admitting that Snow was right would also cost the government thousands and thousands in money to improve. And what we need to understand is outside of Soho, John Snow's work was very limited. Now, I'm not going to read through this next bit, but why was there so many developments in the year 1700 to 1900? Think about the factors. We've got individuals and government. Technology and attitudes. I'll just leave that if you wanted to pause it. Finishing off this video, I think it's really important that you have a timeline overview of this time period. Use this in your final preparation for your GCSEs for the industrial medicine part of the course. Don't forget to watch the other videos on the other parts of this course in preparation for your GCSEs.